Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming on this beautiful day. I'm just amazed we filled this room uh, on a Sunday that's where the weather is absolutely perfect. It just shows you that uh, true gardeners are diversified. <laughs> My name is Mary Lauder. I'm a Project Green volunteer. Um, she's not here, but you've probably seen Beth Fisher running around. She is the librarian for the Iowa City Public Library who handles all the technology involved with the production of these garden forums. Thank you so much, Beth, and thank the Iowa City Public Library for allowing us to do this here. Um, Project Green is a volunteer organization of mostly Iowa Cityans whose job is to beautify this city with trees and shrubs. And um, these forums we have every February, March, and April. Um, just to give something back to the community for all the incredible number of volunteer hours that are donated to Project Green. And our biggest fundraiser of the year is the big plant sale. It's happening May 5th at uh, Carver Hawkeye Arena. And I hope you can all come. You'll see lots of posters around town for that. Um, the library has put down, out a great assortment of books that are available for checkout. Uh, that are about the topic we're having today. Uh, our speaker, Susan, will be talking more about these books, um, which one she's familiar with. Beth asks that you be sure to check these out. Take them to the checkout place and give them your card and get them out. Don't just walk out the door with them or they won't be around anymore. Um, but they have an, a lovely assortment of books. Feel free to look at them over the break. All right, so what we're going to do here is our speaker will talk for approximately an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we really request that you limit your questions or comments during this presentation because it is um, recorded and presented live on the, uh, on channel, on the cable channel 10 um, as we speak. Uh, the people at home will not be able to hear your questions if you speak from the audience. However, each of you has a piece of paper and pencil on your, on your chair. Write down your questions as you think of them. Bring them up here during the break, just right here on the podium, and we will read the questions and Susan will answer them after the break. So that way everybody at home or who sees the video of this um, presentation will know what's going on, okay? So please feel, do write the questions. That's a big part of our uh, production today is the question and answer period. Uh, those of you who do not have, who have not signed up for the door prizes yet, do so at the back table here. There are five or six door prizes here. We have a number of seeds and some books about herbs, and we'll be starting to give out the door prizes about the time of the break. So Susan will talk for an hour and 15 minutes or so, then we'll take a break, at which time you can get up, use the bathroom. Great co coffee and cookies made by the Project Green volunteers. Look at the books, and then we'll sit that back down again after about 20 minutes and do the question and answer session. It is with great pleasure today that I introduce our speaker, Susan Applegate Hurst. Susan has been editor of more things than I can list at the, at the moment. She has done lots and lots of uh, symposia on um, gardening in various forms. Her current um, job is the owner of Apple Applegate. Hearst. No, Applehurst. Applehurst. <laughs> I can't ever get it right. Anyway, Applehurst is a great little store in Winterset, Iowa that used to be the county jail of Winterset, Iowa. And uh, if you're ever going to see the bridges of Madison County, make sure you stop there. Um, uh, I won't go on at great length because you came here to hear Susan, not me. So let me now present Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thanks for spending your sunny Sunday afternoon indoors, but you know, you're not getting a sunburn, so this is a good thing to do, right? It's so nice out and everybody's jumping the gun on the garden because the garden's jumping the gun on us. But fortunately, there are still things you can do in your garden. I'll share that with you later. You can start planting some things now. But I'm going to start out with telling you a little bit about myself. Oh, we've got more handouts. Who needs a handout? they got the copies ready. Keep your hand up until you get your, your copy of the handout. And those notes are general. There's lots of room on there for you to make more notes of your own. It is not a copy of my slide presentation, because I want you to watch 
the screen and listen to me and not have to worry about following along. So don't worry about that. A lot of it's on there. Um, as Mary said, I, my, my husband and I are the owners of the old Madison County Jail in Winterset. And um, I guess I can show you a picture of that. It looks like a house from this end. <laughs> the other end has the bars on it. And uh, uh, actually, this door, let me get my pointer out. This door here was the entrance to the dispatch and the sheriff's office, and now that's our dining room and living room. And this entrance over here, um, one door was to the jail, and one door was to the jail kitchen, the only kitchen in the building. Because back in those days, if you were the sheriff's wife, it was like being the preacher's wife. You got stuck with extra duties. And quite often, the sheriff's wife cooked for everyone in the building. I mean, everyone in the building. Uh, but right now, that's my office. And we have the store in this building. And Applehurst was built in 1903. Well, the jail was built in 1903. Yeah. And my, um, and my husband and I bought the building a year ago, Thanksgiving, and moved in. It was sold by the county in 95. So it was a jail for a long, long time. And we haven't really done very much to it. We're the fourth owners. But um, it really is the jail inside. And then last May, we opened a store. Actually, it's my store. This is my fault. Um, and it's inside the jail part. And we live upstairs and downstairs. But the, in the jail is the actual store. And I've been able to combine. All, we have two more people up here, three more that need handouts at the front. Um, oh, and fourth one over here. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, I used to be, the last thing I did before we did this, I was a garden editor at Better Homes and Gardens magazine. And, um, but I've also been a whole lot of other things. I have a very checkered serial career. <laughs> and um, in fact, in 22 years ago, we lived here in Iowa City, and I worked in the President's Office in Affirmative Action and EEO as a trainer. Um, so I've done lots of other things since then, but this store lets me make a catalyst for all the things I like. I love to do classes. I love to play with plants. I love regional art and artisans. And this way, I get to put it all in one spot and pretend that I, it's mine for a while. Um, but I, I, do, I have a bird store, Iowa wines. I, I passed the first level sommelier exam a couple years ago because I was really interested in wine. And I wanted to put Iowa wine in the right context. And, um, and there's herbs in the summer. There's uh, succulents and terrarium plants and miniature garden plants right now. There's antiques. There's all kinds of stuff. And uh, quite a few of you came to visit me last summer. Um, um, what, like a dozen of you, Fern, something like that, that came and had lunch on the patio? Yeah, we have two more up here. No, three, four, five. <laughs> Your arm's getting tired, I know. Um, and the store changes a little bit now and again, but it is an awful lot of fun. And in, I got to tell you, being your own boss is a different kind of stress from working for somebody else. But I get to light the fuse on that cannon every morning because it's my cannon. So <laughs> I like that part about it. Um, and this is the patio. This used to be the exercise yard. That's one of my lazy sons sitting there. <laughs> and um, uh, you can see this concrete border that runs the perimeter on the patio, that's, this was the exercise yard. They just cut the fence down. And a previous owner bricked it with brick from um, Des Moines, from Euclid Avenue. And so we've added lots of cuteness to the outside. And it really is a lovely place. So please come see us in Winterset. You can get a to-go lunch and sit on the patio. And because I need smart, good-looking people sitting here. And I'd be happy to have you come join me. All right, let's talk about the herbs. This was my yard in West Des Moines, where I used to have my herb garden. We've got one more back here. Put your hand up. There. Did we use them all up? Yay. All right. This was my front yard in West Des Moines. This is the garden I left behind. This, I do not have a garden like this anymore. <laughs> now I have a dry gravel piece in the corner of the exercise yard with about that much soil and four feet of pea gravel under it. But that works for herbs, because they like this kind of thing. Um, but in West Des Moines, I had a garden. Most of my herb garden was in the front, where I got morning sun, had good drainage. The limestone steps and the alkaline soil were good for a lot of the herbs. So if you have something kind of like this, you're probably going to be very happy with your herb garden. But let's first talk about what herbs are and what the scope of today's talk is going to be. So what is an herb? An herb is a useful plant. Well, that's pretty broad, isn't it? 
Well, useful plants are something that we have collected and discarded and we travel around the world with and we use them for all kinds of things. We're going to focus mostly on herbs that make our food taste good, on the culinary herbs, but useful herbs could be anything that made your home smell better, got rid of pests, um, were acted as medicine, all kinds of things. And this is a huge, 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 huge topic. We cannot cover all of that in an hour and few. I can't cover that in two hours, although I would certainly try. But um, we're going to focus on the culinary herbs that most of you are already familiar with, and maybe we'll add a few more that you didn't know were easy to grow and easy to use. And also things you can plant right now and what you should plant later and um, how to use those things. And you know, a lot of times I, when people come to see me about their herb plants, they'll say, you know, I have, I have one of these and I got a couple of those, but what do you do with them? And I always say, you don't have to do anything with them. You can just grow them for fun. They're fun to have. Pet them, smell them, just look at them. You don't, what do you do with hostas? Now that's useless. <laughs> Sorry, Mary. No, they, it, ornament, we, we use ornamental plants all the time and we never feel like we have to do anything with them. You don't have to do anything with herbs either. But they do have a great payback. So this is the lavender I could grow in my front yard in West Des Moines and it was so happy here it made babies, which is something you really want to have happen because we're kind of on the edge for lavender at this part of the country. Um, I see some heads shaking. Yeah, there's a, we have a, lavender is a wonderful thing to grow but it can be kind of iffy. Um, and it's a little pickier about drainage and about soil pH than many things, but you can still do this if you choose the right plant and give it the right spot. Um, but, you know, growing and using herbs, using, you know, I use that term loosely. You don't have to cook with all of them. You can just enjoy them for, you can make potpourri if you want, but nobody says you have to. And one thing about herbs I want you to understand is if you have any collection compulsions. You're one of those people that just, you know, likes to amass things. Herbs can be kind of a problem, so watch out. This is a slide to remind me to tell you about that because um, this is only two kinds of basil. This is um, um, probably not purple ruffles. It's a purple basil and a green basil. And yes, there the green basil is blooming and it shouldn't be. You should get it before it blooms. We'll talk about that later. But there are dozens of basils because they will easily um, cross and create new basils and if you've let your basil grow to seed in the garden it's very happy to reseed isn't it and then it might cross and turn into other flavors that you don't really like herbs are such a fascinating thing because they give us an up-close view of the variation in plant life um, if you've studied botany at all you know how plants share many qualities and if you want to have just a garden of lemon flavored herbs you could have quite a few plants and they'd all be different species because they share many of those flavor characteristics between themselves. Lemon is very popular or very common um, uh, flavor element or aroma element. So is camphor. So is what you think of as mint. Um, it's a lot of those qualities uh, are very volatile. They're easy for us to um, force the plant to release that and we can taste it. And taste and smell is so important to our lives. And we have such an old part of our brain that, is, um, that remembers scent really well. You know how the scent of something can bring back a memory just instantaneously, something you haven't thought about in ages. But the flavors and aromas of, of our food can be enhanced so much by herbs. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about, about how they're useful in food. But this is your warning. If, you, if you're one of those people that can't stop, um, maybe you should leave. But this is why you really came. You want to cook with it. And how many people are pesto fans? Lots of pesto fans. This is, that's the, probably the biggest number of requests I get in the store is where's the basil? And you know what? I don't sell a lot of basil plants on purpose. I want you to grow them. They're so much easier and cheaper to deal with if you plant seed. And if you plant a succession of seed, you'll have basil all summer long. All right, so let's talk about how we're going to use these plants. First thing comes first, um, you pick the right spot. And if you get nothing else out of today, good drainage. Good drainage is really important. Most of the culinary herbs that we're accustomed to using came from the Mediterranean area, North Africa, um, Southern Europe, a warmer climate, not really super rich soil. These are pretty tough plants that had great flavor characteristics and people keep growing them. So sometimes I wonder, did the plant make 
us carry them around or did we carry the plants around? I don't know which. But you really want full sun and good drainage. You can get away with afternoon shade for a lot of these plants, but you can't get away with soggy soil. Very few things are going to be happy that way. You know, there's a, a couple mints that like that, and that might be one way to keep them a little bit under control of making them too, making them unhappy. But basically, full sun, good drainage, and protection from the wind is nice if you're on a hillside or you buy a gravel road. How much fun is it to wash lettuce when you live by the gravel road? You know how everything gets so dirty, and you're growing a leaf crop here. So protection from the wind will keep things like dill from getting knocked over, or angelica, some of the tall things, but it'll also help keep things a little bit cleaner and easier to use, because you do want to use them, right? So the right plant in the right place. I want you to start your own seeds, and I really encourage you to do that, and some of the prizes today are start your own seeds. It's very easy to do. And there are a few garden bullies, so we'll talk about some of those along the way, too. Uh, how many people already grow herbs in here? Okay, quite a few, but I'm still going to talk to you like you don't know anything, all right? So we'll just, that way everybody gets their questions answered. Uh, this is a tray full of herbs. Remember I talked about the collecting compulsion? You know, you start, that's the danger. If you pick up an empty flat, you will fill it. That's what happens when you go gardening. There's actually, a, you know, there's, a, there's a, um, a neuropsychology concept about us wanting to complete things. So maybe, you know, picking up the flat is just the start. But this is a flat full of different herbs. And as I said, there's, there are so many different plants that share similar characteristics. But this one here is a salvia. And so is that. And so is that. And so is that. And none of them look like the salvia you grow as an annual flower, right? But salvia is a huge, huge, huge group of plants. The garden sage that you grow that goes into the turkey stuffing that is a salvia. So when you are shopping for herbs, look at labels and go to places where they can actually answer your questions or go well armed ahead of time. Uh, these plants aren't necessarily patented and the labels can say anything they want. They could, they could name a cultivar or, you know, like say kitchen's best or it might just say salvia officinalis. Well, which sage is that? This is more about just being informed about what you're going to put in your garden and put in your food, but also you'll learn a lot more. This salvia here, actually they call it Mexican bush sage. It's also called salvia leucantha. It doesn't taste like anything that you want to eat. It's pretty strong, but it's a salvia. And when you go to a lot of places that carry a wide variety of herbs, you'll see this huge, wonderful array of things. Most of which, yes, they're herbs, and most of which, yes, have some flavor or some use, but they might not be the best choice for your plate because they won't taste very good. However, they'll be awesome in the garden. So be sure you know what you're picking up. The, the variegated sages, the yellow and, and um, green, or the, uh, the one called tricolor that has white and purple and green on it, they're beautiful in pots and in the garden, and they will have flavor, but they won't taste like a lot. And then the pineapple sage, if you've ever grown pineapple sage, the leaves smell like pineapple. They smell wonderfully fruity. They don't exactly taste so fruity, but they smell wonderful. So yes, you can put them in things like iced tea, and they will enhance your enjoyment of the iced tea, but they're not going to flavor your iced tea like pineapple. They're going to make your nose and your tongue work together, so that flavor all is wonderful for you. Um, but when you're shopping for herbs, kind of have in mind what you want, and be able to ask questions or know what you're looking for. And then this tray is also a reminder. Remember I mentioned the good drainage? This, um, another thing to add to that would be good ventilation. Our hot, humid summers are kind of rough on a lot of herb plants. They're not accustomed to hot, humid weather for the most part, and they don't like it. So make sure you have enough space so that good drainage and good ventilation go hand in hand, right? We have the wind, but if you're going to block the wind and put things close together, they're not going to be nearly as happy. Let's see, what else I want to tell you about this? Um, there was something else. I'll think of it. It wasn't a lie. I'm sure there was something there. I'll go on. Um, growing in containers. If you don't have a garden spot, containers are fine, but make sure they're big enough. You know those little, those little windowsill herb kits? You see those everywhere, right? And the pots are about, you know, maybe four inches tall and uh, about three across. Those are fine for starting seeds. 
but you will not be able to grow seeds like that on your windowsill and get much out of them. You can start the seeds in there, but making your plants live in there would be like forcing you to live in your Volkswagen for a year. There just isn't enough room to thrive. It just isn't going to work. So you can start seeds like that, and if you want just for cute, yeah, they'll grow, but they'll never get a big enough root mass to really produce enough leaves for you to use very much. So get bigger pots, six inches minimum on annuals, and I try to go 12 to 18 if you can on perennials, nice and nice and deep. Uh, a lot of the hardy perennial herbs that we can grow, like oregano and thyme, they will still, they'll make it through our winters most of the time. This year, everybody made it through the winter. But um, most of the time, they'll make it through the winter, but still, in a pot, that's a lot of root stress. Because you know there are things that you can grow in your garden. If you put it in the pot for the winter, it's a little tougher on it, right? It doesn't come back quite as well. So big pot, as big as you can manage, that's what I would start with. Or even a whiskey barrel and put a few herbs in that, that's even better. Full sun means six hours of sun a day. So that's what you're really going to want is six full hours. Could be mostly morning, could be mostly afternoon. And you experienced gardeners know that morning sun is a little nicer for a lot of plants than the last half of the day sun because it's not quite so hard on them. Um, but you want full sun. A few, if you don't have full sun, what you can do is put in things like um, Mint is more tolerant of that. The calendula, some of the cool weather herbs will tolerate um, more shade in the or more shade throughout the day. And actually, I plant my mint where it gets afternoon shade, partly as a scheme to try and slow it down a little bit. So who's lived to plant mint and regret it? <laughs> yeah, and you know you don't give it away to unsuspecting people. That's not totally. That's wrong. That's wrong. Plants and pots should be protected in the winter. Um, because, like I said, that they, they, they can get enough root damage. There's even a few things I have now that they looked okay on top until about two weeks ago. They looked like they were going to make it, but there's enough root damage that they just couldn't get enough oomph to keep going for the season. So sometimes an unheated garage is all you need, or a shed, and that will help protect it enough in the winter for it to, uh, to come back for you in the spring. I gave you this list on your handout, and I call this a beginner's garden because it, they're familiar with a few extra things thrown in. It gives you a range of growing experience. So there's things from seed, there's things from plants, and um, you'll also be able to have a little bit of um, space in how you get this done. So some are early, some are late. But this is, if you're just starting out, I would aim for this group because perennials are going to take a little while to get established. And the annuals are easy, but I think you'll have the most fun if you start with more than just two things. Try to start with a few more. So what I've got first here are the things you can plant right away. And the first one on the list is chervil. Almost no one knows what chervil is because we don't eat it. And the reason we don't eat it is because we can't dry it. It doesn't taste like anything. Fresh chervil has a lot of flavor. It's a cool season herb. In fact, you could call it a hardy annual. If it germinates in the fall and gets snow cover, it'll be green in the spring. It'll bolt quickly, but it'll be there for the spring as soon as the snow melts. But chervil's in the same family as the cilantro and the dill and the parsley. The cool soil's just fine. Doesn't like hot weather. It's a low-growing plant about, oh, maybe about eight inches tall, and it'll send up some flower spikes. Um, after that. Tastes like a cross between parsley and anise. And it's very good in salads and on eggs. It's pretty mild, so if you don't like the licorice of fennel, um, this might be, might work for you, might not, but give it a try. And um, chervil's one of those things like cilantro. If you, if you buy the little thing of dried cilantro in the grocery store, what's it taste like? Grass clippings. Because the flavor is too volatile, it's just gone. Every time you dry an herb, you're going to lose flavor. You're not going to lose all the flavor, except for chervil and cilantro, but you'll lose some flavor. So chervil is one of those things you really can only enjoy fresh. And you'll also be like the only person on your block who knows that, and so you can lord it over them when you know that, and you say, look what I have already. Um, so coriander and cilantro are the same plant. Did you know that? Coriander is the seed, so it's not an herb. Dried parts, dried seeds and bark and stems we think of those as spices. The leafy parts of the plant are herbs. 
But cilantro is the leafy part of this plant, which is actually named coriander. And the coriander is a seed. So what I do also is I, I might save some seeds. I don't grow it for the seed generally. But you can let it reseed. You can let chervil reseed. You can let dill and parsley and calendulas reseed. So you plant one packet. And with judicious care, you'll never have to plant it again. You're not going to let it all go to seed, though, are you? No, especially dill. That's, we'll talk more about that. But right now, you can put chervil, cilantro, chives, dill, parsley, and calendula in the ground. Even if this weren't warm weather, I would still tell you that because they like cool weather, and as soon as they're ready to germinate, they will. So those can go in right away. Uh, chives, you, yes, you can buy a plant, but certainly you'll find someone who'll give you a chunk for free. And I recommend the onion chives with the round leaf and the little purple flowers on top. Garlic chives are nice, and, they, and yes, the leaves do taste like garlic. They're flat instead of round, like onion chives. And the garlic chives have a white blossom instead of a purple blossom. But in my experience, the garlic chives are way more invasive. They will, yeah, I see lots of heads nodding. They're way more invasive than onion chives. I'll show you to keep those under control a little bit. The dill, scratch a few seeds in. You could do some again later. So like if you like to use dill for leaves, Go ahead and put it in now, and, and you might want to use some for pickles later, but if um, you don't want it to go to seed before the cukes are ready, because who knows what the weather's going to be like, I would wait and plant more dill again later so that you've got what you need for both leaves and seed heads for the pickles. Uh, parsley is one of those things I think is underappreciated. I prefer the Italian flat leaf, and you can buy both the curly and the flat in the store. To me, the Italian flat leaf is a lot uh, more robust in flavor, but it's very easy to grow. And it's also, it's also a host plant, like dill is, for swallowtail butterflies. Curly parsley makes a beautiful front border in a flower bed because it stays bushy and green all season. And when you see the big yellow and black caterpillars there, just leave them be. They won't eat the whole thing. They'll be fine. Um, but parsley is also one of those that uh, Lore says that the parsley seed has to go to the devil and back seven times before it germinates or something like that. It takes a little longer to germinate, but if you have fresh seed, I don't think it takes much longer at all. So I, it, it, and you, you'll see in books, it'll say it could take up to a month to germinate. I've never had that happen. Maybe that was old seed or a different, a, a different um, cultivar. I don't know, but I've never had problems with parsley. And it is a biennial, which means it lives two years. So you can put it in a pot, bring it in for the winter, and keep it and use it through the winter, but it'll bolt right away in the spring. So I always just plant new every year. You won't, you won't get much out of that second season for parsley. Um, and calendula, an edible flower. So it's, and it was useful. It's not medicinal, but it was a useful plant. Cor the, the, the flowers of calendula are bright yellow. Uh, the leaves are edible too, but the bright yellow flowers have been used in the past to color things like butter. Um, also, you can pull the little petals off of them and sprinkle them in salad. Um, or add them to um, an herb butter or something like that. But you know you put edible flowers in a plate and people think you're Martha Stewart's sister. So it doesn't, and it doesn't take but a couple to do that. So, and calendulas are fun for kids to plant too because they have a, cl a cat claw shaped seed and they're kind of big. So, and you can get them in, in yet bright gold. Ooh, did we lose me, Beth? There I am. To um, creamy colored with rust tones in them. There's, there's a lot to choose. So go ahead and plant those now. Later this, this season, you can plant your basil later. Did you hear me? Later. Later for the basil. And nasturtiums, another edible flower. The basil, my general rule is I never put plants or seeds in the ground until Memorial Day here in Iowa. And we often have nice weather in early May. Lots of Mother's Days are lovely, right? And we all go to the garden center on Mother's Day, and they count on us to do that. But how many nice Memorial Days can you think of in the last 10 years? Memorial Day is almost always cold and rainy and nasty, and basil hates that. You don't gain anything by starting earlier with basil. You just don't. But it's still worth a gamble, isn't it? Okay. So, and you can start it indoors. Basil transplants quite nicely. 
So you can start seeds indoors, which I might do now because you can actually get them outside here. It's going to cool off here in a little bit in a couple days. But you can start them indoors, move them outdoors during the day as the sun and the weather allow, and they'll be ready to grow. If we, if we do get nice weather and no more frost, well, hey, you got lucky. But if you're planting it now because you think you can get away with it, just realize you better not plant that whole packet because that it, it might all be zapped by frost. We could still get 25 degrees in April. You never know. So, but basil hates nights in the 50s. So there's just no point in trying to do it earlier if you want a real crop because it just it's going to sit there and sulk and get a little bit sick and it won't really take off. But once hot weather hits, it'll just boom right out of the ground and you'll have all you need. And I also recommend planting basil every couple of weeks. You said you did that last year, right, Mary? Yeah, because that way, because you know, it's not it doesn't live all summer long. It wants to flower, right, and set seed. So if you plant it every couple of weeks, you'll have a supply going all through the summer, and it'll still be there for the tomatoes when they're ready. Because if you plant it now, it'll be over with before the tomatoes are there. So plant basil every couple of weeks. Nasturtiums, another edible flower, taste like radishes. So the calendulas don't taste like much, but the nasturtiums taste like a radish. I'm not a huge radish fan, but again, it's another edible flower, and they're striking reds and oranges, cream. Um, they're really pretty. Uh, just a few on top of potato salad, and oh my gosh, people just think you're a genius. Okay, transplants. So the, the first part is seed. You can easily do. And I don't recommend buying basil. I, I, you know, I, my apologies to the greenhouse industry, but most growers, most commercial growers, plant way too many basil seeds in those pots. I've seen as many as 11 plants in the middle of a four-inch pot. That, that's just dumb. Uh, most basil seed is very, it's viable for a long time. It has a very high germination rate. 11 plants crammed in the middle of a little pot means none of them will do well. So when you, when you plant basil, don't plant it close together. And if you buy a pot of basil and it's like that, try to find one that's not. Try to find one that has only one or two plants in there. If they're little enough, you can tease them apart and replant them and they'll survive pretty well. Um, but uh, these things are so easy to grow, I just wouldn't bother with four inch pots unless you just really have to have them. So the transplants are the things that grow more slowly or that simply aren't available through seed. So, I've got up here sage, lavender, oregano, and thyme. You can grow those plants easily by seed. And if you've got patience, that's fine. I've done that before. But they're a little bit faster, so if you want more production faster, you just start with the plants. But sage is very easy to grow from seed. Lavender can be too, but it varies a lot more. Um, with lots of different oreganos and thymes, so I would certainly give that a try if you want. But if you're starting with a garden, it's kind of nice to be able to pick up a few that you can just pop right in and you'll have something to harvest a lot quicker. Um, and also, only from cuttings, tarragon, French tarragon. It's an artemisia that almost never flowers. And when it does, it almost never sets viable seed. And I have no idea where the original mother plant came from. You know, we've all been passing it around. But it's, it's an artemisia. It's not terribly invasive, not like the ornamental artemisias in your garden, not like Sweet Annie or not like um, Silver Queen. Um, it's, it's much easier to handle than that. A four-inch pot of tarragon will end up being, in, in probably in two years, about that big around at the base. You know, it'll go from four inches to about like this in two years. But it doesn't run like other artemisias do, and it doesn't cast seed everywhere like some of the annual ones do. But to get the flavor you want, get a pot. Uh, there is seed for out there for something called Russian tarragon. It's not worth your time. It's baloney. Um, it's a different species and doesn't taste like anything. And rosemary, you can grow rosemary from seed if you want to be this tall in August. So uh, there's enough rosemary in the whole wide world as far as I'm concerned. So I always start with a pot and there are different kinds. And here in Iowa, because of our hot, humid climate, we need the ventilation, right? So you want an upright rosemary. If you've got it in pots, you can do a prostrate that drapes over the side. And if you've been to California, you've seen the, you know, the big banks, rocky banks with beautiful rosemary growing down the side. We can't do that here. It's too wet. And they, they don't like, there's no ventilation. They get soggy from um, too much rain in June or you know, a couple storms in a row in July. So do an upright rosemary. 
Um, I happen to like um, one called Gorizia, um, G-O-R-I-Z-I-A, but there are lots of others. There's one called ARP, A-R-P, that's a little hardier. There's one called Hardy Hill, that's a little hardier, but we're talking hardy from zone eight to maybe seven and a half. That's not us. Although, I know people who have had rosemary that survived this year. Yeah, Which, and that happened back in what, 2003? And then probably had, didn't happen again for years. It's just very iffy. So with rosemary, only from cuttings or plants. So you can do seed with these, I'd prefer to do plants, but you have to do plants with these, I think, here in Iowa. Uh, let's see, what else am I want to tell you on this? I, you know, I'm, I could talk for too long, so I'm trying not to get hung up on too much here. Edible flowers, the Johnny Jump Ups are edible, pansies are edible, but if you buy them from the nursery, they have probably, and they've been grown out in pots, they've probably been treated with growth regulators and possible, possibly also with fungicides. That's very easy to grow these from seed. Johnny jump ups are very easy to use, and yeah, they can spread and reseed, but you know what? There's worse weeds to have, um, which makes, I know what I wanted to tell you a while back, and I forgot. Um, I didn't talk too much about soil, so let me mention that first. Uh, you know, when you're doing a vegetable garden, you need really good soil, right? You need good fertile soil, nice loam, drains well, a little on the rich side. Herbs don't need that. You can put herbs in crummy soil because they aren't growing fruits. You know, you need to grow tomatoes and peppers and cukes. If you're growing a fruit crop, they need a lot more juice to get going. But you're growing leaf crops, and they don't need to be very fertile, and they don't really want a lot of extra water or extra fertilizer because they'll get big. It's just like, like weeds. You know, people in books used to say that herbs prefer poor, dry soil. Well, so does dock and thistles. You know, what if you, what if you watered and fertilized them? They'd be monsters. Well, when, when you water and fertilize herbs too much, they end up getting big and juicy and a little bit more, they're, they're less robust in flavor. So the flavor is generally better if you're not babying them and over fertilizing and over watering. So you don't need a lot of fertile soil. Plants like, um, like pansies are a little hungrier than that, but generally you could put down layers of wet newspaper on your lawn and some chips, poke holes in it and plant herbs in it and they should be just fine. So you really don't need to fertilize um, herbs. The flower on the, on the um, right there, when you go to stores that sell cute little herb cards and mugs and stuff like that, you often see a plant that's uh, on it named borage. But hardly anybody grows borage. Uh, it's a pot herb, but to me it looks a little hairy to be eating it. Um, but I'll tell you what, it, uh, the flowers are beautiful little flowers that are, they have that true blue you hardly ever see in the garden. And um, they're beautiful on a plate or in ice molds. And if you candy the flowers, they taste like watermelon. Because the plant tastes a little like cucumber, um, but when you put a little sugar to that cucumber flavor, it tastes like watermelon, which makes sense when you think about it. But also, it recedes very easily. We don't use it as a medicinal anymore, but it's also nice to have in your garden for pollinators. Um, one thing about the borage is it tends to flop. So don't, you know, a drier spot that drains well is better for it too. But edible flowers are, it's like, you can put herbs into a dish and you'll taste it and you'll smell it, but you put a little color on top like this and then they just, it just, the whole thing just seems way more special. And all it took was a few little things, you know, a little handful of flowers or a few sprigs of an herb. So it doesn't take a lot to do this. So, and I really encourage you to give this a try. And there are lots of lists online for safe ones. You cannot eat all flowers. I want to make that perfectly clear. There are a lot of flowers that you cannot eat. They will make you sick. Some will make you very sick. But the herbs, are, excuse me, the flowers of the culinary herbs that you're used to eating, they're all perfectly edible. So those are safe. Oregano, sage, whatever, those are, those are safe to eat. Okay, let's talk about taking care of these. We, I mentioned the soil and the drainage and the sun. Those are your basics. But all season long, you're going to do regular gardening with them. They don't take a lot of care, but you want to give them some care. 
And I've added mulching to this. Again, I mentioned the leaves, washing leaves. I hate washing leaf lettuce. I just hate it. So I always mulch in my garden to keep the soil from bouncing back up on it. It also keeps disease down. I wouldn't put a super heavy mulch on most herbs because again, that holds in moisture and do we want really moist soil? Not necessarily. So not a heavy mulch, but enough to help keep them clean and help keep the weeds down. And you're gonna keep the weeds out, you're gonna thin them out for things that reseed. You make sure you don't leave it all there because it'll crowd itself, just like those too many basil seeds in that pot from the greenhouse. If you have too many seeds close together in the garden, same kind of problem, nobody thrives. So get your hoe out and, or get your scissors and clip them off and throw them in the salad when they're babies. Um, staking the tall things can be helpful in a windy area, but you won't need to do much of that. Angelica, if you grow that, likes to be staked. Um, dill doesn't really need it. Um, if, it's if it's not too crowded, it'll be fine. But you're going to pinch and prune and deadhead all season long. That's another way of saying you're going to harvest all season long. When you pinch something off, you're not just doing it to you know, shape it up. That's to eat, right? Maybe you eat it right there in the garden. So, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't like you have to be out there every week taking care of it, but um, I, would, I would hope that you, and we'll talk about harvest later, I would hope that you're planning to use a little bit of herb all season long, but maybe plan to make a harvest at some point so you can preserve it, so you can keep it in the freezer or make something with it that you'll have in the winter, because you'll be so glad you did. No fertilizing. And just like other perennial plants that first season, you need to watch the water because a potted perennial of any kind needs to get enough water to get established, right? You know that old saying about perennials that the, you know, the first year they sleep, second year they creep, third year they leap? Well, it's the same as true of potted perennials, or potted perennial herbs. So you don't want to get them soaked, but they're going to need you to keep an eye on things. And the tender plants in winter, you're going to either take them indoors or let them die and start over the next year. But the, the big one is rosemary. And we'll talk about that in a second too. But they don't take a lot of care, but it's the kind of thing that rewards you if you go out every day or every other day or so and just take a look at things and, you know, and pet them and then sniff them and they smell so good. It just, it's, that's your version of aromatherapy. And you didn't have to go to the aromatherapist to do it. So it, they're really pretty easy to care for and you don't have to do anything, right? Except enjoy them. Okay, early spring, like right about now. This is time. And I'm pulling back our, yeah, no, that's oregano. I'm pulling back the, straw, the dead leaves and the straw, and I don't clean up my herb garden in the fall. I don't know about you, but with ornamental perennials, I don't clean those up in the fall either, unless they're like sick and I have to get rid of them. Because the, the extra leaves, and keeping the extra litter on top will, will help most perennials get through the winter better than if you just clean everything off. I know some people just have to have a clean garden in the fall. Number one, I'm tired by then. I'm not going to do it. And number two, the plants survive better if they have a little bit of protection. So I leave it all on here and you're going to pull it back in the spring. And um, I wouldn't, like, this time of year, you know, this spring, this spring makes everything like, what do I do different? Well, it's a little bit ahead. We still have the gamble of frost. So at this point, I have cleaned off, even though we could get frost, because they're growing so fast right now. And if you leave the leaves on top, they're getting yellow and spindly. So they're, they're going to get damaged by a frost if we get one anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and clean things off. And just pull the leaves back um, and snip off all the dead stuff. And let's look at some specifics. Oh. The chives. Remember I told you that the garlic chives are more invasive than onion chives, but chives in general, you plant them once and it's very hard to get rid of them. Um, what I do is I let them bloom. And see, these are, these are just finishing their blooms here. They have that pretty purple puffball, which is an edible flower. Remember, the flowers of culinary herbs are edible. And you can pull the little, the little, balls, uh, little flowers off the little ball and throw them in salad. I would resist the temptation to pop an entire one in your mouth. <laughs> it's not that great. It's a little overwhelming. But I, um, when the flowers bloom, here's your first non-recipe recipe. When the flowers are just opened, fill a quart jar with chive blossoms. And then top it up with distilled vinegar. Get a wooden spoon, poke them down so they get under the vinegar completely. Put a cap on, put it in the cupboard for two or three weeks and forget about it. 
and two or three weeks later, you'll have the prettiest pink onion scented vinegar for salad dressings. And it will be pretty pink. Now, it's pretty pink, but do not put it in the windowsill because that'll make it brown. Sun oxidizes flavor and color, so you're going to keep it secret in the dark. And then when you've got your, your chive blossom vinegar made and the, and the blossoms have faded, you know how sometimes chives, like by August, they're just like laying all over the place, they're flopping around? Well, this is what you do. You make a kid go cut them down. <laughs> this one's 22. He doesn't know I still show this slide. Um, but cut them off like two inches. Just get completely off. You're not going to hurt them. They'll be right back up. And one thing this does is it helps force the chives to go back up and less to go out. So it'll help control some of that outward spread because you've cut them off completely. You can discard them. They'll make the compost stink for a day or two unless you throw something brown in there with it. But um, cut them off. They'll be right back up. And at the end of the summer, they'll be much tidier looking, less floppy. They might bloom again a little bit. Um, but that, that helps keep chives under control. Cutting things back hard in general on plants like this that are typically kind of invasive will help keep them under control a whole lot better. Watch out for some of these invasive guys. Um, Artemisia, as I mentioned that earlier, Sweet Annie is a wonderful herb growing for um, uh, making wreaths and for potpourri. It smells like apples. It's, it's, it's very, very nice, but it is so invasive tiny, tiny, tiny little seeds that blow in the wind. I planted some at my house in West Des Moines in probably about 2000 and realized that was a problem. And when I moved out last year, um, I was still finding some, I, I pull it every chance I got. It was just, it's, it lasts forever. And it hides under the spirea and all kinds of places. So watch out for the artemisias. And the ones that are used for potpourri, the fancy ornamental ones, if you've grown those, you know they run under the ground and they will take over. They're just like mint. So keep an eye on those. Um, anybody know what this is, this plant? Horseradish. That's horseradish. And you know horseradish has roots that go all the way to China, doesn't it? So and if you don't dig them and use them, they end up being football size. They're just, they're huge and they're hard to get, like a dandelion. If you don't get the entire root, it will just keep coming up and coming up and coming up. So if you plant horseradish, plant it someplace where you know you can leave it. Same with comfrey. Comfrey is a, a, uses a medicinal herb sometimes, and comfrey plants are very rich in nutrients because those deep roots also bring up a lot of minerals from the soil. And people use them in compost or fertilizer. But once it's planted, it's not going anywhere. It's really hard to get rid of. Dill, talk about dill a little bit. Dill has, like basil and like um, uh, the artemisia, has lots and lots of seeds, and they're almost all germinate, and they will last for a long time under the soil. So keep an eye on the dill and harvest it or cut it off before it reseeds, unless you really want it to. And then my last one, uh, point here is mint. The hint of mint is a square stem. Things in the mint family have a square stem. Basil, sage, monarda, uh, or bee balm, um, all the mints. Anything with a square stem has the danger of running or reseeding or both. So a lot of the sages aren't that bad about it, but many of the things in the mint family are very invasive. So a square stem is your hint. Well, I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm gonna keep an eye on this. Do I have the personality to control this plant? Yeah, that hint of mint is a square stem. Watch out for that. And mint gets its own pot. I would not put it in the ground unless you're really, really, really sure you want it there. Um, this is, in fact, I just took this. So I've got all this dead stuff on top of the pot. These are all just the extra, you know, the straw, the extra sticks left from dead mint. It's coming right back up, and it's going to fill that pot. Put it in a pot with a saucer under it. Um, a lot of people will say, well, I put it in a pot, and I sink the pot. No, it'll climb out over the top, it'll come out the drainage hole and come back up. So keep it completely away from everything else. Um, I had mine planted again in, in, in afternoon shade. I put it in big saucer bowls that had no drainage holes and I just, I used a hammer and I made some cracks in it. I mean literally it only had cracks. And I set it kind of up on top of the soil. But I still had to watch for the arms that, that run out. And they're going to get away. 
you know, you go to the grocery store, you come back, it's done. <laughs> so you start with a taller pot, a big tall pot, put the mint in that, and then it's so aggressive, it will kill itself. You ever had that happen? In two or three years, that pot will be so full, it'll choke itself out. So every two or three years, I pull the whole root mass out, I chop about a quarter of it out, and I dispose of the rest, find some way that it won't get back in there somehow. Don't give it away to people, that's mean. Um, and repot a quarter of it, and it'll come up really nice and be vigorous and healthy. But it will, it will grow so much in that one pot, it will kill itself. Um, and for some of you, that may be perfectly fine. You may decide, that's what I want to have happen. Um, mints are a whole lot of fun. Uh, there's a one called chocolate mint that a lot of people think is just, you know, that's what they really, really want. But there are no chocolate esters in, in chocolate mint. It's just, it's, you know, it's this memory thing again. You smell something that smells kind of like a York peppermint patty. Oh my gosh, it's chocolate. No, it's not. Um, and there's some that are tall and some that are very fuzzy and some that are very, uh, they're variegated in yellow and gold. Some have citrusy flavors, some are spearmint, some are pepperminty. The original mint is actually spearmint. It's not peppermint. Peppermint showed up later. It's it because mints all cross each other. But the original, the mentha officinalis, the, the original apothecary's mint is a spearmint. So so what's double mint gum? Spearmint and peppermint, both. Okay. You've been warned about mint. Don't say you weren't warned. Um, Rosemary is one of those that has to go indoors in the winter because it's not hard enough for us here. I mentioned that earlier. And, but, and, and remember I said don't sink your pot of mint in the ground, but you can sink your pot of rosemary in the ground. So the, I've got this planted in a gallon pot and I sank the pot all the way down so the soil levels were even in the pot and on the ground. And then in September, I lift that up and wash off the pot and get it ready to go indoors. I like to take mine in for the winter because when it gets to be this big, I hate to go back to spring with another four inch pot. Remember, we said there wasn't enough rosemary in the whole wide world, so I like to get nice big rosemary plants and keep them as long as I can. But it's not always successful. So that's why I think we should have a support group for those of us that want to overwinter rosemary indoors. Because it seems like it'll do really well, and it's coming through February, and oh yeah, it's going to make it, no powdery mildew, and then March, something happens, and it's dead. And you almost got there. But every time I, most time I do a class like this and I, I say that, I'll have someone who's, who's like not much of a gardener. I've had mine for eight years. <laughs> so I have kept them for three and four and I had two plants when I moved to my house at the jail last year and they didn't make the move because it was November and cold and it was, you know, I had other things to worry about and it didn't really work out. But this plant um, I dug up and it made through the winter just fine. The tough part is the light. It really needs a lot of light. And we have a lot of gray days. If you can put under, under grow lights in the winter, that's good. It needs good ventilation. It sometimes gets powdery mildew, you know, like just a white uh, pow you know, powder looking on the leaves. No, you cannot wash it off and eat it. Don't eat that. Washing it off won't do you any good. Um, I cut off any powdery mildew stuff. And it's, it's possible, you know, one of those useful plants again, you can make um, like a quadruple strength chamomile tea which has some antifungal properties and spritz it with that um, in the winter if you think you're going to your risk of powdery mildew let it dry off completely and that can help reduce the powdery mildew um, it can help didn't say it would cure it but it can help and if you're trying to get through the winter just get it through the winter take it out in the spring cut off all the old stuff let it grow back up to me that's worth the effort so um, the, like I said, the rosemary, you can start over with a plant in the spring, but if you can keep one going all winter, I, it, it's very satisfying to have a big plant like this in May rather than like this in May. Okay, the best part. Remember I said you're going to be harvesting all season long. You could pinch a few leaves any time, but I hope that you're planning on harvesting like your basil, for example, all you pesto fans. You've planned to do some basil seeding every couple of weeks and you're going to harvest it at a point when it's before it's blooming so that you can actually enjoy good flavors and you put it in the freezer or make an herb butter or something with it and that way you've got it for the following year because there's nothing like having fresh herb flavor in the winter. If you've compared the flavor of dried to fresh, there is no comparison. It is a different experience entirely. 
and I strongly urge you to, to, to freeze some, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. But um, if you do want to use your herbs, you need to like, plan for it. Like, you know, what are you going to do with all your tomatoes? Well, you might have a little plan in the back of your head. Well, I'm either going to give them away, or I'm going to make sauce or something. Maybe pick one or two of the herbs and make the same kind of plan. Generally, you're going to harvest plants before they flower. Um, and this can be kind of hard. And the reason you do this is because the plant, what's, you know, a plant has a purpose other than life just to make you happy, um, especially the annuals. Their whole mission is to grow in the spring, get over through the summer, make babies and die, right? And when a plant flowers, its purpose has changed. It's focused on those flowers, and the chemistry of the plant has changed. If you let your basil flower and you taste the leaf from the top of the plant, and a leaf from the bottom of the plant, you can taste the difference. You know how they call it, call it sweet basil sometimes? That's because it's not sugar sweet, it's a lack of bitterness. And when you taste the leaf from the top and the bottom at flowering time, you can tell, oh, that's what that means. The, the camphor is stronger, and the, the sweet, the mildness of it disappears after the flowers begin to form. And a lot of plants are like that. And if you grow cilantro, or if you'd like to shop for cilantro in the grocery store, when you see cilantro in the grocery store, it doesn't have flower spikes in it, does it? It's all mittany leaves. And that's because they, they know it doesn't have much of a life, and you're going to re-sow that too every two weeks, because the, you know, the packet that says slow boat cilantro, well, that's like, what, an extra week? That's, that's not slower, really. So you plant it, and you plan to cut the entire plant down at one time, if you can, if you need to, because letting it go to seed, you know, if you want it to go to seed, that's fine, but once it's begun to go to seed, different flavor on those plants. Um, and what I do, like I said, I don't like washing lettuce, and I mulch a little bit, so what I do is I take my garden hose sprayer, and I go out in the evening before, or early in the morning of, and I wash everything down, and I go underneath, get everything cleaned off, let it all dry off in the morning sun, and then I harvest dry leaves. Because you know, if you put, if you take the leaves inside, like what's it like to wash basil, then chop it up in the cutting board? It's all over your hands, all over the knife blades, all over the cut, and then you're scraping it off, and it doesn't, you know, who wants to do that? If you're working with dry, clean herb leaves, it is so much easier. It will go, it, you make the, it's easier to work with when you're making pesto, it doesn't dilute the vinegars, it's easier to just sprinkle it on things, so you've got wet clumps and if you wash it. So, and if, you, and if you wash basil and pat it dry, you know it turns black on the edges because you've ruptured plant cells, or this, the leaf cells, and they begin to oxidize. And that also changes the flavor. So just get it clean in the garden and then harvest it. Cut, take your cuttings, turn them over, look for any hang, you know, livestock hanging on, and then pull them apart and use them. It's so much easier to wash them in the garden. And if you mulched, they won't get dirty when you hose them down. They'll be cleaner when you hose them down. Uh, the perennial plants like oregano and tarragon, a little bit of that ongoing all summer is just fine. The short-lived annuals like cilantro, all at once. Even basil. You know, in a lot of Italy, they plant basil and they plan to cut the whole thing at once. They don't let it go to seed or let it, let it flower. Um, in this country, in commercial harvest, they grow varieties that branch out really well, and they'll take like a third of the plant off at a time and then do more harvesting. They're also doing a lot of fertilizing. Um, but um, you could do that with basil too. There's nothing wrong with cutting. Oh, and you know what else you can do with basil? If you, if you cut you know, long stems of basil and you pull the leaves off, leave the top two or three leaves on. This is sort of a cheat. It's not really supposed to, not supposed to do this, but I do it anyway. Um, leave a few leaves at the top of the plant and then stick them in a glass of water. They root just like that. And then, and then, yeah, they're water roots, but you can plant them and they'll grow just fine. So it's like a way of you're, you're getting more plants if you're greedy for that kind of stuff like I am. So, um, so if you have basil, that square stem, what else, do you, what else roots easily that has a square stem that's ornamental? Coleus? Mint family. Okay. Um, other plants or any question about it, about half the plant at a time. It, that way you won't, if it's a perennial, you won't stress it so much that you kill it and it'll, it will still um, produce pretty well for you. So, but some of the short-lived stuff, just get it over with. And you know what? A lot, I know a lot of people like to take basil in for the winter, and they make that plant just work so hard. 
And it's just, you know, just start over. Don't drag them inside. And they get all tall and spindly, and they don't taste that good anyway. You know, sow some more seeds in the fall and bring it inside if you want to. But um, it's not meant to be a perennial. It's meant to live a short season and die. And I just let it go. And I always feel bad for basil in the winter when people drag it inside. For the best flavor, though, don't harvest it right away. Remember that oregano I was pulling back the leaves and the, and the straw from? It makes a nice green mound in a very short time. And there, there does have some flavor, but it won't taste like a lot. Wait until we get some hot weather. That will really bring flavor out. Let it get some growth on it and let the weather get nice and warm and you'll be able to harvest it. Same with any of the other plants. They have flavor when they're very little, but it won't be a lot. So like when you, if you're thinning and you're throwing those little clippings into the salads, they're perfectly tolerable that way. They won't be so strong that nobody likes them. Um, catch it before it flowers. This is um, that oregano again. Now it's all big and tall and it's getting flower spikes on it. I like to, I, I'll harvest some. I like to let some of it bloom for the bees. Oregano is a great bee plant, by the way. And then I give it, um, then I just cut it way back. And um, that way, again, like other perennials, it won't get that dead donut in the middle when it flops open. It forces it to come back up and look nice and, and charming in the middle. Um, so these little flowers up here, there's buds on that. Hopefully you're getting, getting to the plant before that. And cut it off. It'll grow right back up. Again, it's forcing it to go in that same spot. Oregano is another one of those that it does have a square stem, but it can be invasive, and it recedes very readily, too. Here's some happy dill. This is what dill looks like when it's, when it's you know, not growing 18 in a pot or you know, one little spot in your garden. This is unhappy dill. It's like a dill forest. Look how spindly and tall it is. And yes, it's blooming, but it's, it's too close together. You really need to thin dill out so you give it the plants enough room to thrive, whether you're going for leaves or for, or for the seed heads, either one. And these, these are um, at the end of, they're blooming a little bit of the yellow blooms, um, but you want to keep an eye on them when they're, they're green. This is true of most of the plants. When the, leaf, when the little seed pods are still green, you're safe. You're still safe to cut it down. But what I want you to do is pick out one of them. Okay, they're turning from green to tan. Pick out one or two of the biggest, strongest, or nicest plants and just grab a hold of that head and aim it right there. That way it won't fling seed over here and seed over there. And it's a whole lot easier to keep it in control. And that way you'll still have dill again in the next season, but it won't be out of control. And, and you'll be able to pick up seedlings and move them or thin them out much more easily. But get rid of the rest. Don't let them, don't let them, make, um, uh, don't let them be the boss of your garden. The pinching back flowering to delay, that's, that's kind of a myth. Yes, it will flower again later. That's, technically, that's a delay. But remember I said that the flavor has changed. So this is cilantro that's gone from having the mittany leaves like this, like you see in the grocery store cilantro, or like this, to the little ferny ones at the top. And it's got a seed stalk. That's what's, that's what's called bolting. You know, lettuce does it. Lots of plants bolt with a seed or a flower stalk up the middle. And cilantro is one of those. Too late. You've waited too long. But you've been sowing it every two weeks, so it doesn't matter. You've got more coming, right? Um, and basil, same way. I think that's the next one. Yes. It's really sneaky. It's not one of those things you go to the grocery store and come back and it's all over with. When you look at this in the middle, you see this? That's, that's a little sign that's about to bloom. That one's got, that's the beginnings of the flower buds. So when you see it in the middle of the top of the plant or the end of the stem, it, this nice little geometric, looks like a succulent, a little tiny succulent in the middle there, cut it off. Get the whole stem and harvest it. If you wait any longer, it's, it's going to bloom. And again, the flavor begins to change. So watch your basil um, at the ends of the stems. That little, wish I could zoom it in more for you. But this is your sign. That's it. <coughs> Game's up. Freezing. Like I said, fresh is so much better than dried. And the only way to get good fresh flavor in the winter is if you're going to freeze it. And this is what I do. Remember, you washed off the leaves before, so they're dry when you harvest them, and they're easy to handle. You're going to put two packed cups of clean, dry herbs in the food processor. This will work in the, in the blender, too, but I would cut this in half. 
because um, it's harder to get everything down in the blender. This works great in a food processor, and of course you can do it by hand if you want. But it's two pack cups of clean, dry herbs. Give that a couple pulses to chop it. Not, not you know, don't go, eh, just a couple of pulses. And then you're going to add a quarter cup of oil and a couple more pulses, and that's it. And I pack that um, in these little tiny containers without much head space because, you know, what's the enemy of flavor in frozen food? Air. So you're trying to keep the, keep the air to a minimum. And or another way, like, and I, I really do it, I swear. And, um, uh-oh, the lid's coming off. Because um, that way, every time you get it out to use it, it will thaw a tiny little bit and you can scoop the edges. But if you have a big container, that means over, this, over the winter you're taking it in and out and in and out and you're going to create more frost and, and um, have it thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze. So do it in small amounts. And the other thing I do is, uh, and this is actually a lot easier, is I'll, I make this, the herb paste like this and then I'll put it in, just into a freezer bag like that and pat it flat. And I put, it, I put like two or three of them in a heavy duty bag so when I'm cooking, now all I got to do is reach in and I snap off a chunk, and that's it. So this is way easier to, oh, it smells good. This is way easier to, to use, and, you know, just don't be like me. I, I tend to hoard it, so then, you know, like, I, oh, I don't want to use it all up. Well, then, you know, it's May, and I still got a whole bunch left. Um, but that's, that's probably the easiest way to preserve it, and frozen is just way better. You can't really sprinkle herb like this, but you can cook with it. Um, if you like to do teas, or if you like to sprinkle dried basil, my, my husband and sons like to sprinkle dried basil on pizza. So that's the only reason I would dry that. Um, but if you want to dry herbs for teas or infusions, that also makes sense. This, with a little bit of oil, wouldn't be such an appetizing result if you're trying to make a tea with it. Um, but if you want to dry herbs, I should have brought my coat hanger with me. I do them on a coat hanger. Take two or three stems. And, and not a whole bunch, because if you've got a bunch of moist herb stems and they don't breathe or don't ventilate well, then you're going to have mold or something growing. Two or three stems, wrap them with a rubber band a bunch of times, and then put on a, on a coat hanger and then bring it around over the top and hook it back on. Don't use string, because remember, you're going to dry these things, and this is the worst joke I tell, is that you know, if you use string, once they get dry, they shrink and then they fall down and commit herbicide. So the, so the rubber band goes around them tighter and holds them in place as they dry. You don't need to put them in the oven. Please don't put them in the microwave. You can use a food dryer, but remember, every time you dry herbs, you lose flavor. Every time you increase the heat on that drying process, you drive off more flavor. When you put herbs into a stew or soup and you can smell them, flavor. It's all disappearing. So every time you heat an herb, you're making the volatile parts of that flavor dissipate. So you're trying to keep it in, and, and freezing, none of it's going to get away until it gets into the pot and heats up, right? So that works out pretty well. Um, anything else about drying or freezing? Nope. Okay. Remember, write your questions down, and we'll answer those here at the end. Um, next, when you're cooking with fresh herbs, you're going to use two to three times more of the fresh than the dried, because when you dry it, it shrinks, right? So it measures less. Um, and what, this is what I recommend, is about, one, and this is to start out, I end up using more than this, and I, for some reason, I think it's because fresh herbs have more, a more, a broader flavor profile than a dried herb, and because when you dry it, you lose some of those flavors. I think you can overdo dried herbs in some recipes, but it's harder to overdo fresh ones, and I think it's because of the flavor changes, I don't know. I, I, remember, I remember when I was a kid and I would, when I was cooking like, I don't know, 12 or 13, I remember one time making goulash and one of the boys said, oh, Susan made the goulash again. Because I put oregano and stuff like that in it, it was too much. But um, my mom and dad are in the front row, that's why I'm talking to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, uh, you can start with a smaller amount, but then I think you can use more with the fresh herbs or the frozen herbs than with the dry, you can get away with that. So when you're cooking, one to two teaspoons of fresh herbs per cup of flour is like a general rule. So if you want to experiment, these are the non-recipe recipes kind of here. And you've got some actual recipes in your handout. But in general, one to two teaspoons of fresh herb per cup of flour. And if it's dried herb, you're going to cut that in half, right? 
Um, and something else I do for presents sometimes, and you can come and look at this later, this is uh, dried sage in a corn muffin mix. So this is essentially a box of Jiffy corn mu muffin mix with dried sage in it from my garden, so it's sort of homemade. Um, <laughs> so this is a sage muffin mix, and then I made this, this cute little leaf print with sage leaf and um, an acrylic paint, and on the inside, and this is a, sh a shopping tag, or shipping tag, I wrote the recipe for what to do with what's in here. Now I can do this with dried herbs. You can't do this with fresh unless you're going to cook it right away, right? Because the moisture in that cut leaf will mold in the flour. So dry will keep, but not the fresh. Use the fresh right away. Um, let's see, yes, I just said that. Okay, and vinegars. I told you I meant the chai vinegar, remember? And, and I said quart jar full of blossoms, not packed full, but just full to the top, and cover that with distilled vinegar. You can use cider vinegar, but cider vinegar has its own flavor. If that's your plan, that's fine. But distilled doesn't have a flavor. The flavor comes out of the plant and it flavors the vinegar. The oils and the flavor come out to, finish, to um, flavor that. So um, if you're making basil vinegar, and I've got a purple basil vinegar here, and if you want to, you come up and sniff these. This is, uh, this is just a green basil, and they smell differently, actually. This is probably two or three years old, and I keep shaking it up, but um, the acid in the, in, the, uh, in the vinegar will break down the cell walls and release the flavor. You do not, you do not have to heat the vinegar. I see that over and over and over. You do not have to heat the vinegar. You can put, um, and what I do is I do it in a fruit jar, not in a bottle like this, but put um, uh, loosely fill, like a quart fruit jar, whatever container it is, loosely fill it with herb, and then top it up, completely top it up with vinegar. Use a wooden spoon handle and just you know, poke it down under there, get the air bubbles out, break the leaves up a little bit, put it in the dark, and let it steep like that. That's all you have to do. And then when, you, um, and when it's flavored like you want it to, strain out the old stuff put it in a new bottle, and then put your little, pretty little sprig of herb in here, because one sprig did not flavor this bottle. It takes a lot more plant material than that to flavor it. So this just has one sprig for pretty, and this has been in here for two or three years, and it's disintegrating. It's perfectly safe. It doesn't look so appetizing right now, but um, it's perfectly safe. Vinegar is a, is a time-worn way of preserving herb flavor. Oils are a little different, and I'll just give you the extension version of this, and I would check with the uh, University of Georgia to get it you know, whatever the latest on it is. But I know people for generations have flavored oils to preserve herb flavor and used it later. But the difference with er oil and vinegar is that vinegar is acid and oil is not. And it is possible for anaerobic bacteria to grow in oil. It's possible. And there are people that heat the oil and put the herbs in that. And maybe that's what they think is killing any um, uh, bacteria. I'm just going to leave you, you know, Check it yourself. And if you do make a flavored oil, I would use it up in a couple of days. Um, some people go for a lot longer. I know families have been doing this for generations and they had no problem. But you know, there are still people out there who think you can can in the dishwasher too. So, uh, no, there are. And um, that's not recommended. So, um, all it takes is one time. All it takes is one mistake or one time that it didn't go like you planned if you aren't using a proven method. Um, with butters, Oh, I have that over here, too. I'm going to walk back and forth for Beth. All right. Um, herb butters are very easy to make. And no, you can't really see this very well. Um, basically, it's a quarter cup of finely minced herbs to a stick of butter. And it does take a quarter cup. It's not one or two teaspoons. It's about a quarter cup of fresh minced herbs to one stick of butter. And what I generally do is um, you can just do it in a bowl. It doesn't have to go in the food processor. You can. Just don't process the heck out of it because it turns the butter green, which isn't very appetizing. Um, so th and then I basically try to wrap it back up in the same butter wrapper. And then I freeze it. And then the winner, I can slice it all. I can use it all at once. You can use it right away, of course. Um, but I would really encourage you to try making one flavor with, like, like with your turkey herbs, with sage and thyme, and maybe a little white pepper. Um, but make an herb butter and either eat it right away or put it into a, like a log like this, and you can slice it off throughout the winter, a piece melting on, a, on, a, on top of a grilled, um, a butter coin on top of a piece of grilled chicken or fish or steak. It's like a sauce. 
And all you did was do, it was one time, it took a few sprigs of something, one recipe, and you enjoy it for several meals in the winter, and you'll just be so glad that you did that. Um, it's very easy to use. Like I said, make one for Thanksgiving dinner, and you'll be such a show-off. And, and you'll do it again, because it's so easy to do. Um, and the butters, again, you've got chopped little leaf parts in the butter. If you don't freeze it, over time, those little leaf parts are just like the food in the crisper drawer. It will get nasty. So you use it within a couple of days or freeze it. Okay? So herb butters you use right away or freeze them. Oils, I can use them in a couple of weeks. With meats, you could make dried herb rubs, but you can also make fresh herb rubs and freeze the rub in a baggie and then just save it for later and rub it on the meat and then do your grilling or broiling. Um, and always add it to vegetables, omelets, salads, things like that. When you've got this, when you've, when the reason you've got this little bit of oil in this recipe is um, because that oil is enough just to coat every little cut piece of leaf and help reduce flavor loss. It also makes it easier to break up those pieces or chop it out when you want to get them out of there. So it's a very small amount of oil. You can freeze pesto by leaving out the cheese and the nuts, which takes a lot more oil. Or you could just do this, takes up less space in the freezer, and then add the oil and the cheese and the nuts in the winter. And then you've got pesto. Oh, we're at the end, and I only went five minutes over. 